Welcome back to another episode of the Battle Buddy Podcast. Today, we've got a great conversation lined up for you. We've got the author of a, of a great book uh, where he outlines his story of service. Uh, we're going to talk about transition, uh, being a citizen soldier. There's a lot on the table today. Uh, so you definitely want to tune in uh, for a fascinating conversation. So without further ado, let's dive into today's conversation. Welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast with Keith McKeever. Welcome to the podcast, Robert. Thanks, Keith. Glad to be here. Yeah, well, I'm glad to have you here uh, and to, to highlight, you know, your book. I know that's not the, the, the main reason you're here. We're here to talk about a lot of different things, but uh, you got a really cool book, Citizen Soldier. Uh, I know kind of the overarching kind of topic today um, because you were, uh, you know, in the war on terror. Obviously, you had active duty, you had guard and reserve, and some people fit in that citizen soldier. I was active duty, but, uh, but you... You uh, fit in that citizen soldier category, which was a huge component to fighting those wars. Um, but uh, before we dive into that, tell us a little bit about your service so people can get a, a better picture of uh, of who you are and what you did. Sure. So I date back, my service dates back to, uh, to 1986. A uh, young college student transferred to a university from community college and an ROTC program. I always wanted to serve. I thought I can do them both. Plus, they're going to pay for school. Plus, uh, you know, I can have a, a military career and a civilian career. So it just worked out well. And, and so I was commissioned in 1988 and uh, I enjoyed it. So many good experiences. Again, some challenges along the way as well that we've all had in the military. Um, but but there I was uh, in 2004, 15 years in the National Guard, deployed uh, for training in Europe and Central America. Uh, but this was a real deal in 04 going to Iraq. And uh, again, 15 years in, 39 years old. Uh, my book talks about what led up to it and uh, the experiences. And, and then really, I think, important for veterans and non-veterans alike is the afterward, right? Like what transpires after. People think you flip a switch and everything goes back. Uh, and then I finished five more years, retired with 20 years of service and really enjoyed working with all the branches, especially when you're deployed. You have an appreciation with all kidding aside of the different branches, even our international partners. So, uh, so, so that's my military career, really 88 to 08. And then several years later, my youngest son, who was 12 when I deployed, uh, joined the military. He was an infantry type, uh, six years, Army Ranger. So it's great to, to see, you know, your family members. But when they're in harm's way, it's a little different perspective than yourself. Well, you know, I, I don't have that perspective because my, kid, my kids are still young. But uh, sure. you're definitely right about serving with other branches. You know, my first deployment was, um, it was actually an Army role. You know, we had, you know, obviously I was Air Force, but we were with a lot of Army. There was some Navy there. I guess theater-wise, we kind of aligned under the Marine Corps. But there was, you know, pretty much every branch was was represented in one way, uh, shape, or form. Second deployment for me was Balad. You know, Joint Base mm -hmm. Balad was huge. Everybody was there. Sure. Uh, but, yeah, occasionally you would see, you know, other countries roll through. And, um, you know, you really have to work side by side with all the other branches. And it is interesting how they operate. You know, for, for, from my perspective, it was, it was interesting. My first deployment, I would... I was kind of in charge of supply. I mean, another airman. We'd go to the army guys for supply, and we'd walk in their shop, and just just the way they interacted with each other was just different than the air force, and it's just different world. Um, but that's what makes it all tick and makes it all work, which is interesting. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, we we fast forward to today, right? We reflect back on our experiences and some of your viewers that that are, are veterans, others that maybe are serving today, and you see our our um, connection with uh, international partners. Our troops over in Poland, great partners of Polish, uh, Ukrainian, of course, with their issues. We we serve with them in, in Iraq, uh, shoulder to shoulder, and, and so many other nations in Central and Eastern Europe. So so historically, we look where we are and, and uh, you know what we did shoulder to shoulder back then, and uh, the impact that may have had on on uh, of course their their efforts today, and, and our impact with some viewers you may have in Europe, stationed there and deployed there that uh, that are you know right on right on the edge of, of who knows what's to follow absolutely well it's great that we have those connections where we can just kind of train with partners around the world and it makes us all stronger especially as allies so and inner service too uh to be able to know what each other's capable of because you know hey um you know all jokes aside you don't want the air force in there kicking in doors you want you want the army and marines doing that <laughs> <laughs> but hey, if you need a flight to uh, to go on leave or a pass or go, you know, from Balad to Kuwait and then back, it's nice to to have an aircraft that's flying way up there and uh, not have to do the convoy thing all the time, right? 
That's that's right. I, you know, I had a cousin that was in the uh, in the core, and you know, he gave me a hard time all the time. I said, "Hey, man, who brought you? Who brought you all your food, your water, and your ammo?" That's right, the Air Force or the Navy. So there you go. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but anyway, uh, so you know, after your service, you wrote this book. Um, very interesting perspectives. So why did you decide to write a book? Well, where, where uh, I had the material. Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me just share first. I had the material. It wasn't just recollection or maybe it would have been uh, a much shorter book, right? It's been uh, 18 years, almost 19 years ago since I deployed in 04 for a year. And and so why I was there was so impactful, right? I was leaving my wife and my three kids, 12, 14, and 16. Uh, and, and, and again, we have different experiences, units deploying, but they were putting a unit together, a team uh, to be attached to the Polish division. And, uh, and Illinois and Poland have had this partnership for peace for 30 years now because of the population of Polish in Chicago, of course, second largest population outside of Warsaw, Poland. Great partnership. Um, and so they wanted to replace 11 soldiers with 11 others. And so they're looking for volunteers. It wasn't a unit, right? It was just a conglomerate of, of, uh, of, of soldiers that would go. And, uh, and so I outlined how I came to that decision to go to my family and say, how am I going to decide I want to, but I also, you know, it's this tug and, and pull. Um, and I didn't have the excuse of our units getting deployed. Right. Um, so, so again, I was 15 years in, I was uh, 39 years old. It was probably now or never. I remember nine 11 so vividly. Um, and, and so that was the pathway, um, you know, the discussion that I, I point out in the book, but to write it, I had a journal because when I got there, I, you know, we, you never know what you never know, right. Anything could happen. You may or may not come home. Um, and so I wanted this journal as far as a, a, a document, my, my events, and that was the basis for writing the book, but it was in a box in an attic for 18 years, you know? And, and so a couple things happened. First of all, I had a granddaughter, she's two and a half now. And I thought, you know, my story, my experience is going to get lost and you want to have something that you can share with families. I wish, you know, my generations ago would have shared their stories. Could you imagine about world war one or world war two, Korea, Vietnam, if you had a family member. So that was a driver and the other driver. Uh, was Fred. And I'll just uh, show a quick photo. Fred was a Marine and he was a Marine during the Korean War. He's 92 today. I got to meet him at a Memorial Day service where he was just in the background and we chatted. Now we're good friends. The bottom line is he shared his story about being a POW in Korea for six months uh, as a 19 year old Marine. Of course, we know what happened at the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir and he was in the mix of that, right? Survived miraculously. And the bottom line, again, is that he wrote his story. He didn't write it. He told it over the phone because he doesn't do Internet, right, to a Vietnam veteran friend from his hometown. And his friend transcribed it and uh, all this shit. So I, it's like, how could I tell, how could I not write my story? I have the material. He's 92. 70 years ago, he writes or, or shares the story. So uh, I wanted to do it. I just kept putting it off. And finally, I found a pathway to do it. And uh, I'm so glad I did because you, Keith, and every listener all have stories. We, you know, if you wrote all of the stories about your military experiences, it would be volumes, right? But I think we have an obligation to share with the general population some of these stories. And I have all the respect for generals that write these stories, but it's from echelons above division, right? It's like way up there, the big picture, which is great. Or our special forces friends listening, my son was uh, a special forces operator. But, you know, what about the first, you know, the, the, the folks in the trenches, you know, not that I was uh, E2 or anything, but those that are doing the daily uh, missions to get a perspective from them. So all those wrapped up together is, is why I wrote the book. Yeah. The, the, uh, oh, how do I put this? Uh, not to, yeah. The not so um, sexy and glamorous uh, views, you know, the, the general perspective and the, uh, the Delta force and the seals guys, Hey, they got cool. They got cool jobs, right? Not everybody can do that. And they got stories for days that are really cool mixed for some, tremendous reading um but yeah our uh us normal guys <laughs> our, our stories are a little bit more oh gosh i don't want to say boring but they're more normal mundane y y i don't know uh, maybe not the best way to put it but they're they're the, the normal perspective even though yeah, you know, yeah. they're all different but you know mm -hmm. i mean maybe not the best way to put it but it's the more typical experience when it comes to serving in the military and, and experiences overseas, even though everybody's was so wildly different. 
Absolutely. But we all have so, so many things in common. We have a conversation about a couple of things, whether we're in Afghanistan, whether we're in Iraq or uh, elsewhere, or even if we just supported our troops from Germany, we all have experiences, right? We're away from home. We miss our family. You know, we don't have what we would love to have. You know, we're, we're working as a team, the person to our left and right, even if we're at basic training, right? And we have that, that common bond. I did want to add one thing, Keith, about why I wrote the book. And, and this is uh, uh, another photo I share at events and things. And these are the the three folks uh, that I write about that didn't make it back and uh, different connections I have with them and different experiences. And, and uh, you know, at least in one case, I didn't even know the identity of, of that individual. I just knew that they were next to me in a flag covered casket and that uh, they had died that uh, earlier that day. And so the book led me to do follow up research to find out who was that person? What was their circumstance? And so uh, it wasn't just I wrote my notes for my journal, but I, I, I looked to the backgrounds of these individuals and share with the readers. Again, one a Marine Corps uh, captain pilot, one a reserve uh, uh, sergeant, uh, and another one a National Guard soldiers from, again, all components. And again, I wanted to sort of tell what was available from their story so that the reader, especially even non-veterans, right, they have a feeling or an understanding a little bit of uh of uh you know some things that transpired and the sense of loss and the and and the reality of that and uh so i wanted to share a little bit about them as well and how we interacted absolutely well that's that's um that's great that you 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 know would would do that for their memory um and to continue to share that you know when you go talk to people uh and keep their memory alive because that's you know, that's one of the, the sad things when, when, when you're gone, no matter how you leave this world, you know, keeping somebody's memory and legacy alive um, so that you're not forgotten is, is an important thing. So uh, I know you've, you've done some other things in your book and some other things that you talk about that I really wanted to highlight. Uh, and I know you really want to talk about it, too. You've done something very interesting with your book uh, that I don't think I've ever seen anybody else do. You've got some little video clips that you got on YouTube and you've got some QR codes in there. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. And so, you know, we're so focused in today's society about seeing and hearing and video and visual, right? All the military video games are so popular with, I'll say the younger generation, but, you know, that that evolves into, you know, uh, others as well, even even older. Um, and so, you know, they want to see and hear and feel it. So uh, in 04, I had a digital camera. And uh, so I would have that with me, you know, just to kind of memorialize the experience. And uh, one video I sent home to my family from my little living container. Everything is fine. You know, uh, you know, but they they had that right. Although in the background, the medevacs were coming in, so that was a little. I had to kind of sidestep that a little bit, but nonetheless, it was a way to connect, right? So um, what I did was I had a series of eight or ten uh, that I thought how neat it would be for the reader early in the book to scan, just like we had to scan the QR code for menus and things of that nature, touchless, right during the COVID uh, experience. And so now they, the reader, can start off so they don't have to just use their imagination or they can build on it by scanning these. And each of these are not long, a total of, I think, 10 minutes of video time. Some of them are as short as 12 seconds to a couple of minutes. But again, coalition helicopter flight. So in a Polish helicopter flying over the terrain, um, you know, in a convoy going through, uh, you know, villages and towns. Um, again, the message home to make it a little more personal for the for the reader. So I think those... Uh, I haven't seen it. I saw a song in a book, but I haven't seen that integrating, right? The audio visual with the, with the written word so that somebody could, uh, again, have a, a basis for, as they read later about the convoys, they could sort of imagine by having heard and seen it. So that's a piece there. And the second thing I'll just notice, the very first page of, uh, uh, after the QR codes in the introduction uh, in, is the uh, suicide is preventable. And we know that. We talked about, I talked about these casualties killed in action folks I write about, but I write in here right away. So if somebody doesn't read past the first few pages, at least they're going to get this 988, right? We all know that there's that veteran crisis line 1-800, right? They're still pushing that out and that's great. Probably works fine. But in two in the morning when somebody is stressed out about whatever, then text their buddy and the text doesn't go through, they don't get a response and they're just at the worst moment of their life, whatever happened, right? And they're trying to remember 1-800 something, something, something. Well, one of the best things that happened is this 988. Again, we all know 911. Some of us may, as a fifth grader, dial it to see if it worked. And yes, somebody knocked at the door to say, <laughs> we have to show up. But, you know, what if somebody needs 988 and they've never heard of it? You know, how tragic. 
But what if we share this with our buddy and they share it with their cousin, they share it with a cousin's friend and that friend shares it with their grandpa. So whether a veteran or a service member, we can't measure what doesn't happen. I know we measure as best we can how many suicides, but uh, and it doesn't have to be suicidal, right? Maybe somebody's going through a temporary period of depression. Why don't we get these addressed at the at the earliest point and not wait till it gets to that that life or death decision? So I share that with uh, presentations and book uh, events I go to, and I'm surprised even active duty uh, folks, uh, the soldiers that I interact with, half of them have no idea what I'm talking about. Some don't know about 1-800. So just as you, Keith, and your other guests push this out, I think it's so important uh, knowing that since 9-11, we've had 7,000 casualties uh, right in combat, which is too many. It's like an airliner a year, like 360 troops going down every single year for 20 years. Uh, but yet our, our suicides, uh, based on research, is four times that, right? So it's over 30,000 our veterans and our, and our, and our service members uh, that are serving. So that's like four aircraft jetliners going down every single year. Of course, some years are more than, some are less. But, I mean... If we had a jet airliner with military personnel and veterans crashing every three months on average, then that's equivalent to the suicides. Wouldn't we do everything we could? And I know uh, VA and others are pushing this out, but I just think there's more to be done. And that's why I'm hopeful that folks that read my book, maybe they look twice at that uh, 988 number. And uh, I thank you for allowing me to reinforce the importance of that number. Yeah, no problem. Uh, like I told you before we start recording, I mean, I highlight that at the end of every show. Uh, I think that's one of the, the things that every single one of us uh, should know and needs to do a better job of putting out there. And it's not just for us. And I shared a story with you as well that it's it's a number that our spouses need to know, mm-hmm. our, our parents, our siblings, uh, maybe our children if they're old enough. Uh, they need to know what that number is. They also need to kind of know maybe what their, what your triggers are and be able to, to stop you. Right. I'll, I'll borrow, I'll borrow a term from a, a past guest here from a few months ago. Um, he was a helicopter pilot, right. And he, he, you know, spot the, or stop the drift, right. When the helicopter starts drifting one way or another, you know, the co-pilot will say, Hey, you're drifting. Sure. So, you know, when somebody notices you kind of being off, somebody needs to reach out and grab you and say, Hey, there's a problem here. Mm-hmm. And that's what that number is for you know, when you're, when you got that problem, you may not recognize it. So it really is the family members and the people around you, your circle of influence. They're the ones who really need to know that number two. So it's sad that, like you said, you know, the people you talk to, you know, half of active duty don't even know the number. Um, hopefully, boy, uh, hopefully, hopefully a higher percentage than that of their family members know that number. Yeah. So, and of course that's not a scientific survey, but it's just a feel like yeah. I'm going and asking them that question. Like, do you know what this is? And uh, I'm, I was just surprised that they don't. The other thing is, of course, it's, it's a veteran crisis line, but it's, it's available for anybody. Right. So it doesn't have to be military connected. We could have, you know, a relative or friend or somebody else that's going through a difficult time. That's not military, but obviously it's, it's, it's also available for our military folks. And with the disproportionate number of veterans and service members that commit suicide compared to the general population. It's that much more important that, that we share it. Absolutely. Well, I have said it a few times, you know, the, the most important thing is that we want you here tomorrow. You know, that's, that's, that's it. Plain yes. and simple as it is, you know, we, we want our battle buddies here tomorrow. We don't want to get that, that unfortunate news. So uh, I appreciate you sharing that because the more we, sh- the more we talk about it, uh, the more people hear it. Yes. And it, it can potentially save lives. So, um, so you know, you kind of talked, just talked about the book a little bit. Um, so, how did you actually write your book? Then, I mean, you had the you had the journal and stuff, but how did you actually go about kind of compiling that and putting it all together and and doing all that? Did you write that yourself? Did you have somebody help write you write it for you? Uh, well, kind there, of curious on that there, process. Sure, I used a hybrid method, right? There's a lot of pathways to publishing, and if somebody's interested, again, everybody has a story, and even if they want to publish, you know, there's uh, there's options for oral histories in most states, and uh, you know, where a veteran can give that oral history, and so that's a pathway. You don't have to write a book, uh, you know, you can be like Fred and just you know, talk about what transpired, and somebody you know types it up, and and you have that history for your family. It's maybe just a a, a notebook or a, or a few pages that wouldn't exist if you didn't do that. So I encourage people. Some people express their their memory or their experiences through poetry. But my pathway was I was trying to search a way 
uh, because I knew I could just write paragraphs and those turns into pages. But, uh, you know, my uh, my civilian career was with the state police as a trooper. So I did a lot of over those 26 years police reports, you know, just the facts. Right. So on this day at this time, this happened. Here is what I did. Here is the, the results of that. And at first I thought, well, I'll just write the story. It's a journal, right? On uh, July 4th, 2004, we departed Fort Bliss. We landed in Kuwait and we did this. On July 6th, we did this. Uh, well, as I, as I decided on Creator Institute, which is a hybrid model where you join a group of other authors and you go through this process together. Uh, you know, of course, you know, shortly uh, after COVID, it was all online, which was convenient. You didn't have to go anywhere but you had this circle of people that were really in the same shoes and it really is focused on, on first time authors. And I, I found that pathway through a Marine a Naval Academy graduate that I've never met personally, uh, but I knew of from Bunker Labs, another military entrepreneur program that's available across the country in many communities. And I said, well, here's a veteran and you know, you wanna make sure it's credible, right? There's so many, you know, do this and you'll be an author. Uh, and so I looked into it and, and, and looked at their material uh, online. And then I reached out to the owner who's a, uh, the CEO is actually a professor at Georgetown University, so it gives a little more uh, credibility, uh, Eric Custer, and uh, and he makes the phone call to you when you inquire a per person, and he's got a you know fabulous pathway. He started as a professor with his students to get a manuscript written uh, through that, and their motto is never write alone, right? Kind of relates to our military service. You always get somebody you can chit chat with or or have these conversations with you meet weekly. So Creator Institute was a pathway in about five months where you start with a developmental editor, and so that's somewhere where you kind of talk about your ideas, you write some snippets, a few paragraphs, they kind of direct you. Just an example, Keith, uh, for your listeners, like, I was just going to write the facts, right? It's like, no, what did you smell? What did you hear? What did you see? What were you thinking? So all these things that probably regular authors or writers, not first time, are they know you have to think from the reader's perspective, not from yours. You're just not listening. And so going through that process allowed me to finish a manuscript of about 57,000 words in about five months. Um, and then after that, you can do what you want with it to publish it. And, uh, you know, if you're a real famous and somebody you're going to smell, sell a million books, then, you know, publisher will pick you up. But if you're a first time person, I have no history uh, the creator Institute partners with new degree press, and they're a uh, company that, uh, you know, works with first time authors. Um, they have a couple different pathways for funding. It's not really a Kickstarter, but you can have a group of pre-orders at a, at a little premium price for people to get them first. Uh, in my book, I put heroes in the back so folks could, could list their hero. Uh, so there's some pathways to offset the cost of publishing uh, that is unique, uh, or some people just you know, pay it up front. And, uh, and, and so that was a pathway for me. And after you start with New Degree Press, you go from developmental editor to revisions editor, and that's about a two month process. And the bottom line from the day you say, I wanna do this to the day your book is printed, it was about a year, which is, which is reasonable, 270 pages. So it's not a real thin book. Uh, a photo in every chapter, uh, again, the QR code. So I'm very, very happy you have somebody who helps with layout, cop copyright uh, component, the cover work. So it's from beginning to end and uh, and a, a book trailer. So again, there's lots of pathways if somebody's interested, you know, talk to others that have written, compare and contrast. But at the end of the day, uh, this is the path that worked, worked for me. That sounds like a really uh, great path <laughs> because, yeah, yeah you know, writing a book for yeah, for some people could could just be like trying to learn a whole new language, right? There could be a lot to it, you know, from covering, uh, designing the cover and uh, organizing the chapters and organizing your thoughts and all the other little, uh, I'm sure there's a million different nuances to, you know, all the little things that have to go into a book, but to, to have some experts to walk you through it and figure out all those different things, right? You know, the, the, the copyright, the publishing, all that stuff. So, you know, that's a, that's a, it's a whole industry by itself. And if you don't know anything about it, yeah, and I'll just add too. I mean, even little things like how do you upload it to Amazon or to Kobo, which you know connects with Walmart to the world, or to uh, you know the the other platforms that get your book out in front of the public. It's like if you don't have there's there's specific formats, and if it's just off ever, ever so slightly. So like you said, experts to kind of navigate you along the way so that when you upload it, you're good. Uh, and they we did an ebook first, which I thought, well, that's good. I don't know how many people read ebooks, but I found out quite a few. It gives people an option, right? So we uploaded that in January and then the soft cover came out uh, in, in February of 2023. And uh, and then in uh, later in a, another couple of months, we'll have the uh, audio book out because again, a lot of people travel, a lot of people, you know, they're working out. That's how they 
get their material, right? Whether it's a podcast or an audio book. So I just thought that, or vision impaired, I thought that was another pathway. So I'm looking forward to, to that coming out uh, so that, you know, you have a variety of, of ways in order to connect with uh, people that have an interest. Yeah. Audiobooks are, are great. That's one of my personal favorites. Uh, mm -hmm. I love audiobooks, and I know a couple people that have gone through it and, you know, I know there's, there's some challenges there too, right? It, it's right. got its own little nuances. So, yes. uh, but I know that's a great option uh, to be able to have to get another way for somebody to, to enjoy the book. So, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I want to dive a little bit into the, into the book because like you said, it was part of it, it was your story, you journaled, but a lot of it is centered around your family and conversations. So obviously when you're in the guard reserves and you get tasked with a deployment or you choose to go, go someplace like that, you have to have some tough conversations. So, you know, you, you had some conversations with your family members. How did you decide to have those conversations and how did those go before this deployment? Well, I, I, I want to be very structured about it, right? And I wanted them to have a, a, a voice and, uh, and and there's some risk with that, right? I knew what I wanted to do. I felt obligated. I knew my family was strong and independent, would probably become more so uh, if I deployed. Uh, but I write early in the book about how that happened, right? Like we were sitting around a kitchen table, my three kids, 12, 14, and 16, and my wife and I, and I shared and they were confused, like, so your unit's not deploying, but you're thinking about going. It was like, well, I might not go. Even if I expressed interest, they're looking for X number of soldiers with X number of backgrounds for the whole state to draw from. And they're just saying, if you're interested, submit your packet. But if I submit it and they, and they select you, I got to, you know, I've committed. And so we had the discussions of pros and cons and and uh, and we, we basically held a vote. You know, so there are five of us. We each had a vote. And uh, the results results were three to two, so uh, in favor. And uh, and my wife didn't obviously want the uh, the unnecessary risk or being absent, but she knew that that was I was committed to serving and doing my part. And uh, and so she voted yes, and one of the three kids voted yes, and the other two voted no. So again, then you have that quandary. Good for you. Everybody had a voice, but the two that you know obviously they don't want dad to go. You know, you're saying, well, too bad you know, in a more tactful manner, right? But obviously they were concerned as well. So that's just an example of one of the early tensions and, and pulls and tugs. And and my wife asked, well, what if it was three to two the other way? And others have asked me, and I thought, man, it'd be tough to say too bad. I was just kidding. I'm going anyway, but it'd be really tough to say, you know, well, that's it. You know, three's bigger than two. So I'm not, I'm not going to put my name in. So, so I put my name in and obviously I was selected uh, with the team. And, and deployed. And then I write not just about here's what happened on this day, but the connection with home, right? The birthday party, the my, my daughter asking if I would be home for it, you know, after the year, her birthday, anniversaries, all the things we've all experienced. But, uh, you know, kids at school asking the kids, you know, where's your dad? And again, it's not like the whole unit deployed in our in our area when I first deployed. So they were kind of on their own, right? They're in, in, in a school where their dad was was deployed, but no one else's. Uh, right. It's not like the whole unit's gone and, and, and your wife or the other kids can kind of rally around all the other kids, you know, who are in the kind of the same boat. Right. So that was kind of unique. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious then for the for your two kids who voted no. Uh, did you do anything special to the for them or have any special conversations with them to kind of put their mind at ease? Or how did you kind of handle that? Well, uh, you know, you, you, you look at things differently because it, that was like January that we, we decided and I submitted and I found out like in February I was going to go like in June, right, to the training and then to Bliss and then deploy to Kuwait and then on to Iraq. So we had time. And so I think we looked at life differently, like the softball game with my daughter or the wrestling matches with my son or the swimming meet. You know, it's like we need to maximize this. Not that it would be gone, but I and, and I write about some some behaviors right that you could just tell that as we got closer to the deployment date the anxiety you could almost looking back on it tell with the kids right whether they were more clingy or more cranky or some other emotion that wasn't typical and so i write about that so that's i think that's normal and uh and, and so that i you know that that transpired and again we tried to spend quality family time but again i was you know doing more than a weekend drill to prepare for it and overnights and things as we led up to, to the departure for, for Fort Bliss. So, uh, you know, I write about that on both ends and then on the way back, right, on, on and we come back, what did we do that was unique and different to sort of celebrate being reunited and 
how is that different? And my wife points out things that uh, on the other end that uh, the kids kept going to her for things. Hey, can I go to Susie's house overnight? And they would just ignore me. And she's like, hey, your dad's home. And it wasn't a personal thing. They had just for a whole year knew that if you want to do something, go to mom. And so that's just an example. I guess it kind of sad for me. Like we don't really need you, although they didn't mean it that way. But it's that, that example of redeployment where everything doesn't go back to normal uh, right away. I think that's well, I've, I've heard that many times that that's one of the biggest challenges that people have coming back is, you know, finding that role, resettling that in. And uh, I guess for the kids, in a lot of ways, it's a muscle memory. You know, they, it is an yeah. adjustment period once you leave. And then they realize that, you know, whether whether it's mom or dad is gone, you know, the other parent that's still there becomes their everything. And then after six months, nine months, a year, whatever, like, that's all they know. It's muscle memory. That's the only person they go to. And then that person's back. It's, I mean, it would just take time for them to, you know, Oh wait, I can go ask dad. <laughs> yeah. Right they, they the forgot, chair, you know? Yeah. Keith, they forgot the old trick that if mom says no, or dad says no, you go to the other parent and see what they say. Right. But well, uh, sometimes that's not bad. Right. You know? <laughs> right. 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 And, <laughs> and, and I also think that it's, it's, it's everybody getting their battle rhythm, right. Once you deploy, even if you don't, if you're going to training event or something, you, you figure out, okay, here's our, even if it's a classroom training, we show up here, we do this, then we do this. And so you got to kind of, you know, get reacclimated, and, and that's what we experience. But so I write on that on both ends. And then, you know, obviously during the middle, some, some issues, and I'll just share with the audience. I think it's important that one that the kids that voted, no, they had some, some issues while I was gone. And, and my wife was kind of at her wits end, like, I don't know what to do. Um, and, and it turns out that a well-meaning family member or friend after I left had told one of our children that, well, our oldest, right? You're the man of the house now. And again, he didn't know what that meant. I mean, he's going to school. He's not working. I mean, is he going to defend us from a, a, a thief or a robber? Or is he going to, you know, what does that mean? And it, well-meaning, but again, some of those things that kids just cling on to that they think, you know, I don't I don't know what to do. And, and, I, and I share this and my wife got some counseling for our, our son and it helped because it revealed the underlying stressor and and then you know there's an, a sense of relief so it's not just us right that are maybe in harm's way to think that what we saw what we experienced is difficult but our family back home that we think is safe and there's no impact on them uh particularly children there can be and and you know if not addressed you know that could you know sort of become a, a long-term issue so i think that's important for veterans to think about and for non-veterans to think about where it's not just you know it's just not the service member and and it's a little older statistic that i'll share with the viewers or listeners that um you know since 9 11 well over 2 million children have had at least one parent deployed i write about that in the book so you know we've got these children uh that have been affected immensely and it's something we need to think about as you know kids in school or kids in activities those that have parents deployed even if it's a training deployment it's still a deployment and, and they have to deal with the absence and uh, the, the new normal for a bit. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's shaking up their daily life, their routine, everything. Um, and kids are not, kids are just not going to be typically as resilient. They're not going to have the, the life experiences to be right. as resilient as, as adults are. It's just kind of a, a, a fact. So, you know, they, they need the support. They, you know, whether that's more family members around or counselors or whatever, whatever it takes, uh, they, they need the support that's around them to, to get through it. Cause it's, it's difficult on them. I, I can't imagine. Um, I was not, I was not one of those kids that grew up with a, with a parent in the military who had to, to deploy. And I've talked to a few people and that, that were, and that'd be difficult. That'd be difficult to see a parent go away to a foreign land and, be gone for months on end and have no idea if they're going to return, you know, and, and deal with that. Yeah. The only th thing I'd say is worse than that, Keith. And I, I think I mentioned before is uh, one of my kids who voted yes, um, really just want, had a passion for the military. And in, in fact, he decided at that young age of 12 uh, that he was going to go to West Point, which, you know, lofty goal, good luck. Uh, sure enough, he did. And, uh, and he was an infantry officer and served for six years with a uh, ranger uh, unit. And so, you know, he went that path, but, but my other two kids, they went to a summer, you know, they did have a summer week long event for 
kids with parents deployed, as we were talking about. And that was a great event. My youngest loved it. Couldn't get enough of it. The other two, uh, older son and daughter, you know, in their teens, the young teens, they were like having none of it. Right. They're having the marching, eating the mess hall, you know, doing fitness stuff, push ups. And they were like, I don't want to do this. But they had that experience. So they maybe could connect a little bit with some of the hardships that military personnel uh, experience. So they, it opened them up and they were with other kids that had parents deployed. So that was a good program open to everybody in that in that state. So so those types of programs, I think, are very therapeutic and helpful, even if they don't personally enjoy the military lifestyle that they demonstrate for them. Right. Uh, but others, you know, take and run with it. And, and it's it, they have a passion for it. So kids react differently. But as, as parents and adults, I think it's just important or friends and neighbors, uh, family to recognize that, you know, they might need an extra helping hand once in a while, the, the, the single parent, because my wife was basically a single parent for a year. And, uh, you know, that'd be tough if I had to be a single parent for a year. And I know there are, uh, you know, viewers that are single parents and, and it's, I'm sure it's a tough job. But in this situation, you know, you don't know if you're going to continue to be a single parent. And in my case, uh, several years after I got back, uh, my my son deployed to Afghanistan and, and Syria. So, again, the, the flip side of that is super stressful because, you know, what harm, you know, what, what risk looks like in those environments, but there's nothing you can do about it at home, right? You're just hoping and waiting for that mission to be complete. Absolutely. So what, you know, other than the transition difficulties coming home, reintegrating with your wife and your kids, was there any other uh, transition difficulties that you faced coming back in, you know, work or other things or community? Yeah, I, th I think a lot of veterans, you know, have challenges depending on where they are in the civilian workplace, right? Particularly if they're younger, he's 19, 20, 23, maybe, maybe they had to leave college, maybe they were an apprenticeship, maybe they were working for a small business and it was difficult to come back. You know, as a state trooper, uh, you know, that's an, a, a, an occupation historically uh, at the state level that's very supportive of the state, you know, National Guard and, and military in general. So, it was a, it was a, a good transition back and that I was able to, to take some some time off. Of course, you know, as soon as I came back to work, I think it was uh, September of 05. After a couple of weeks off, uh, Hurricane Katrina hit. And so I was at our state uh, headquarters helping to coordinate the logistics. Now, I had just gotten back, so they they weren't going to send me down there with all our firefighters and others. And I was thankful for that. Uh, later, later, years later, I ended up going to Louisiana for hurricanes in New York. But uh, nonetheless, it was nice to kind of, you know, get back, uh, you know, into the routine and do something that was very meaningful right away. It wasn't, you know, and so it was a nice transition. And so, you know, I know we have the employer support of garden reserve, which is an organization that reinforces the support that employers provide above and beyond the legal requirements, right? Because not everybody has that smooth transition. And sometimes the employers don't know what they don't know, particularly if they don't have very many members uh, in the guard or reserve. Um, and, and so they don't know. And, and so, that can really make a world of difference either by adding stress to the service member and their family or minimizing and mitigating the, the stress. And so, you know, if we can be uh, you know, promoters in our community of, of uh, those employers that provide that extra support to, uh, to those that return or even those that, uh, you know, ETS get off active duty when they, when they come back. So it was pretty, pretty smooth. We, each of my kids, we had envisioned a trip, right. That we're going to go, on individually because I wanted to spend individual time. So my daughter wanted to go to the Mall of America. So there I am shopping, but it was a great experience. And my boys wanted to go to an NFL game. And so, you know, they shared that experience together. But again, I think for, for those young uh, service members that have kids, you know, give them something on the other end to look forward to. And if you have more than one child, think about that individual time and, and not just with them, but then with your spouse, right? To individual time to sort of reconnect and bond and 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 uh, de-stress, if you will, and talk about the 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 way forward in the future. Well, speaking of the future, that leads right perfectly into my next question. You know, eventually you did your twenty years and you got out, just like everybody else. Eventually, you take that uniform off for the last time. So, what was that transition out of uniform for you? Were you still working for the state police? Yeah, I, worked for, okay. I, I was. I had about another seven years to serve before I retired from the state police. Uh, at the same time, I was also teaching at a university, just have a passion for teaching. And and had done that since uh, 2001, actually August, just before 9-11. And, uh, and, and so I taught uh, part time there for 16 years. And so I, I instead of doing three things, right, the, the, the National Guard, teaching at a university, 
and the state police. I went from three to two. And what that you meant open was, up a lot of time in your schedule. <laughs> absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I, I would have enjoyed continuing to serve and I certainly had that option, but I felt, I don't know if guilty is the right word, but you know, my family had sacrificed. And so, you know, whether I stayed 21 or 26 or 27 years, you know, I could have more time with them. Michelle wouldn't have to go from the softball game to the swim meet to the wrestling because I was, you know, on, on uh, weekend duty, uh, you know, out in the field somewhere for Friday through Sunday. But, you know, I could be even more involved and I felt they deserved that. And quite frankly, it was nice to have that that extra time with the responsibilities I had at work and, and the, the passion I had for teaching. And uh, and, and I did uh, you know volunteer work with with uh, veterans as well at that point, going to you know, a driver to take folks to the VA hospital. Back then, it was even World War Two veterans that were uh, you know, we had a few more than that uh, would be in the van. And I would enjoy just taking that two hour drive to the VA hospital and, and bring them back, uh, you know, a couple of times a month. So I was able to do more of those things that I enjoyed and, and could give back in community events. So I think every veteran or service member, uh, you know, they need to look at, you know, the way the way ahead for themselves and what that looks like, what that feels like, especially if they're active duty, because they're going from, you know, that's their job to probably looking for a civilian job. And that transition can be stressful and one of the most stressful, mm -hmm. you know, experience of their life because this was the new normal and now they're going out and it's totally different. I think it's, uh, well, definitely a lot harder if you're active duty because that's your full-time job. Right. You know, I, um, that's why I was really curious to ask that. I think it definitely helps and it kind of goes back to some previous questions with your, with your role, you know, coming back from deployment too. I would imagine working for the state police just the role, the structure, the job responsibilities and everything working for the state police. It just, it sinks really well with the military. It just, law enforcement just does. And so I just, kind of a natural progression probably makes for a much smoother transition for a lot of people if they're in a role like that. Absolutely. And I, and I recognize that. And, and, you know, it was interesting, our team of 11, I was the only uh, state police officer on that team, but the team that replaced us of the, I think they had 13, uh, soldiers that they had four that were Illinois state troopers. Right. So, so all people I knew, so, you know, we're doing our transition. And so, you know, we had five state troopers from that state, you know, at the same spot at the same time for, for a while. So, and, and again, it does, uh, it does, uh, you know, go well, fit well, if you will, with, uh, with that, but it's not everybody's experience. And I think that's why in talking about transition that we have a number of active duty folks when they're done that do join the national guard, because they want to stay, you know, within the state under the state mission or the reserve, if there's a reserve unit, because it keeps them connected to some degree. And, and quite frankly, they're among our best, you know, National Guard members because they've had that experience. It used to be the case. Now, it was rare that you'd find a National Guard unit that hadn't deployed once or twice, right, uh, just a few years ago. But but again, it's always evolving. So you have the new enlisted, you know, soldier that maybe hadn't had that experience, but then the others can teach them for the next deployment and, and train them. So having a mixture of active duty and again, different branches, you know, the Air Force folks end up in the Army or vice versa, uh, National Guard, um, you know, that happened too. that cross pollination, which made it a stronger organization because of the variety of experiences and different backgrounds of the of the members in those units. So, uh, you know, that's always an option too to just do that, you know, I'm going to go part time while I get my, you know, get, get settled in my civilian world. And sometimes they end up with active guard or reserves so or they're full time military, but they're in the, you know, air army guard or a reserve unit. So they uh, kind of get the best of both worlds. Yeah. So I kind of have another question for eh, when it comes to retirement, because obviously I didn't stay in long enough to retire. Uh, but I know it sounds like family was a, a huge factor there, but I'm kind of curious if you have any, if, if something else was a factor there when it comes to time to retire and hang it up after 20 years, was there anything else that was a factor or did you wake up one day and be like, you know what, you know, now, now I know for sure it's time to retire. Anything other than family. Uh, I, I know obviously some people, sometimes it's the end of the enlistment and it's just time. Some people obviously get medical boarded or some other factors that, you know, lead to sure. getting out, but some people could go on to serve for another five years, 10 years, whatever. But sometimes people just wake up and just say, you know what? just not feeling it. Like I'm done for whatever reason. Was there, was there anything else like that other than family where you're just like 20 is good? Yeah. I, I, I don't think it was spontaneous. I think almost shortly after I got back, when I realized that 
not everybody made it back. And, you know, I was fortunate and uh, my family supported me. And so I think my decision, even when I was deployed in 0405, is like when I get back, I'll have five years till my 20. I'm certainly not going to, I could step away anytime, right? I didn't have an, an enlistment date. I could, you know, walk away and, and just, you know, be, be done. Um, and, and so I could have that when I very first, in fact, a, a friend of mine who didn't have as many years in as me that, that, that did just that. And, uh, um, so, so those were options, but I think it was a projected, I don't know if I told my wife or anything, like I'll be done in, in five more years. I don't think that conversation had, but I think I mentally knew that, you know, the, the, the financial advantage of, you know, a, a drill pay or extra pay or whatever was, you know, nice, but you know, it's not worth the trade off of, uh, continuing, especially with my other, you know, teaching and, and responsibilities with the state police. It was like, I knew when I get to that 20 mark. So I was more of a, a early decision just because it was enough. Very few people put in 20 years, uh, statistically in our, in our military, because, you know, it's young people that get in, they do their, their, their service, uh, requirement and that's fine. That's, that's all they're asked of. And that's, that's great. Um, so the fact that I, you know, got to 20 years and, had what I would say is a great career, great memories, great people was, uh, was enough. And, and, you know, there's always that temptation of, you know, if you stick around, you know, we got a promotion just, just waiting for you. But I was, I was pretty firm that, uh, I was done and I wished everybody well, and I've stayed connected with, with folks even today, but, um, it's a decision that I think was heavily family, but it was also, you know, I've, I've done enough going, you know, a hundred different directions at this stage in my life. I need to look at the next stage. I think there's, correct me if I'm wrong, if my perspective, like I said, I was, I was active duty, but for the guard and reserve, there's only so many people in the unit. It's not like you're going to PCS to another unit. So, you know, you got promotion, promotion potential could be capped. You have position potential is capped. You know, somebody could be sitting in that slot. They have to retire, <laughs> you know, before you could potentially take over that, sl especially if you're, if you're enlisted, you know, maybe you can't put on staff sergeant or you can't put on master sergeant or, or, you know, whatever, or, or command sergeant major, what maybe you can't put on that rank because somebody's already got it. There's, there's a cap to it. So some people might look at it and be like, Hey, you know what? I'm, I got 20 years. This guy's probably going to do another five. Do I want to hang on for another five years for that rank? Probably not. So that, that's, I was kind of curious, you know, if there was, you know, another factor there, because I'm sure each unit's a little different you know, in its, in its structure and what's going on within it. Yeah. And, you know, it's not unusual for folks in the national guard, if there's opportunities in the, say a reserve unit, you're right. Uh, or I know of people that have, uh, you know, gone from one state to another, if there's an opportunity. So there's usually enough opportunity, uh, for folks, if they, if they want to be flexible and, uh, and do a little driving, <laughs> do a little driving. I knew one that was a pilot and he would just fly. It was like, and, and it's like, all right. Uh, so, so there are pathways if, if that's your passion, I'm not saying I lost my passion, but it ran its course and I was very comfortable with the next chapter, right? It's like this book. I was ready to turn the page and, uh, and, and focus on, on some other things. And I think that, you know, if, if, if veterans or service members now can contemplate, you know, have a game plan, you might adjust left and right a little bit, and it might be you add a year, you get out a year earlier, but have a game plan and don't wait till then. And then say, okay, well, now what I'm going to do. And the army and the military in general, I think has been better with transition because it looks bad on the military, quite frankly, for unemployed veterans out there. So they want to kind of make sure that, you know, there's a bridge from the military. At least that's the experience I saw with my, my son just a few years ago, as he, uh, you know, left the military that they want you to land on your feet and, and have, you know, tools and resources to be successful. Uh, whereas before it seemed like, you know, decades ago with Fred, it was like, all right, good luck, you know, sign here and you're done. It definitely looks bad when, Things are so heavily publicized, unfortunately. Well, we talked about the suicide rate, you know, in mental health earlier. The last 20 something years has not been friendly to that, but obviously it's pretty well known that the homeless, uh, homeless problem, substance abuse, you know, all these different, you know, transition issues. People have a difficulty getting jobs. Like there's, there's a lot of things because of the media and the ability to, to see things on social media that, um, I'm sure it's not it's not helping with the recruitment problems. I won't dive too far down that rabbit hole, but yeah, the military definitely has an interest in making sure people land on their feet and it gets all the good press they can get. Uh, because you know, at the end of the day, uh, we're too old and broke to uh, to throw back on the uniform. 
<laughs> we we need to we need tomorrow's youth to to continue to raise their right hand and follow in our footsteps, and uh, you know, and be the next in line. So yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. I'll just add that you know, and and the VA is a well-meaning institution, and you know, it's been in existence for a very long time, and they do a lot of great work. But we know there are some shortcomings, some gaps, some 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 red tape that uh, is 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 co complicates uh, veterans, um, you know, uh, needs and, uh, you don't have to talk too long to a, to a veteran who's discouraged. And so I'm not saying the VA doesn't do good work, but what I'm saying is there's room for improvement. And I would like to think that they even acknowledge that. And, uh, and so the processing of our veterans getting the help they need, whether it's mental health or, you know, physical or, or other issues, medical, um, there's room for improvement and, and uh, you know, with all the monies that we invest in, in the VA, you know, I would like to think that uh, they're going to be on a trajectory to improve those services and make them more available. And I, it's not that there's not effort to do it. It's just such a big conglomerate. I think sometimes, you know, it, it gets uh, the, 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 the service members that are, you know, they're trying to provide services for get lost up, lost in the, in the red tape. And it's like this form and this and here, all kinds of numbers you can call if you've got questions, but you know, whether it's call waiting or automated attendant or, you know, uh, you know, it'll be a few weeks. And I know they're working on issues. I'm not trying to be negative about the VA, but I'm just saying that's another example where, um, you know, our veterans, I think sometimes are shortchanged and uh, especially those just getting out and looking to kind of get connected. Um, so I know that's another podcast for another day yeah. for another guest, and you probably it, have yeah. I, I look at it like this: it's it's a system, it's the government, it's slow. You just have to realize it's a process, and you have yeah. to attack it like it's a process. You have to know that going into it. So, but um, you know, I guess one of the, you know one of the last things I want to you know ask is what's what's next for you? You know, obviously you've written a book, you you've transitioned out, you're you're retired. Like, you know, what's what's next? in a chapter of life. Yeah. So, so since I, uh, retired in, uh, in, from the state police in, in, uh, 2015, I, uh, again, could have stayed longer. Uh, but, but again, I think sometimes when you see how fragile life is, you value it maybe even more and appreciate it, especially those positions in which there's not maybe as much physical effort as a physical labor type job, although there could be, on any given given day, that it's the, uh, the you know the the mental and the uh, the long term outlook and and so interestingly, I, I reinforce the importance of our veterans, service members planning ahead to use your GI education benefits. I think that's so underutilized. It's like, well, I've got a job and they don't require any further you know tech school or graduate or, or uh, college education or skill set. You know, you can be a welder. And, and use your GA benefits to, uh, you know, to, to learn how to write code or something, right? Or get into AI. You could still be a welder if you love that, but, but, but use those. And so three weeks after I retired, I started a, a doctorate program at the University of Illinois. Um, always been a passion in public administration was the, was the, the degree. And it took about four and a half years, but, uh, but I navigated that. I taught a couple of years full time and did some other things while I did that. Uh, but again, not just because of the GI education benefits, but... Uh, you know, I, I'd like to use that as an example to others that you don't have to do that. It didn't help me. I could still teach college with a master's degree, but it's like do something to help yourself and your family and your future. Once you have an education you know, uh, a credential, you'll never lose it. You can't sell it. So no one can steal it from you. And maybe you'll never use it. But but what if you want to be a substitute teacher, you know, later in your life and, and you don't have that for your degree? And in some states you have to have that or even to your degree. So I went back to, to, to school and, uh, and and then I got involved with a lot of veteran organizations, VFWs, American Legions, and a lot of those organizations, are older veterans are still predominantly the population of that. But it allowed me to connect with these older uh, generation of veterans and, and have interaction and build friendships and and uh, do some volunteer work, which I'm was suddenly the youngest guy <laughs> looking around, right? To, to, you know, you get up in the, in the, uh, I told my wife, there's a park display, military memorial park. And, you know, you get up in the bucket truck that's leaking, you know, hydraulic fluid and get to above that uh, A4 aircraft and, you know, just do a little sanding before we power wash it. And, uh, but, but again, you feel like you're connected to the, to the military community by doing that. So I've done a lot of volunteer work. And uh, of course the book took a year and uh, during COVID we started a, a consulting business uh, related to my public administration, uh, you know, 
uh, dissertation and, and really workplace employee versus employer disconnect that we, we see a lot. So uh, I did a bunch of projects with different organizations. So uh, and and uh, we've got uh, one grandchild, uh, you know, I mentioned two and a half and another one uh, six months away. So we spend a lot of time traveling to, you know, kids and grandkids and uh, just enjoying, you know, the, 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 the world that we live in. And, uh, you know, we've our kids are grown and uh, and empty nest. So, uh, you know, you're trying to set yourself up for uh, things that we don't think about as enjoyable, whether it's a hike, a walk, a kayak, uh, you know. Uh, those types of things that are peaceful, right? Because we've all lived lives where we haven't always had a peaceful environment. So, uh, you know, that's what I, and at the very end of the book, uh, we, we re, I resolve with the reader that, you know, things are not perfect, but we choose, my wife and I, to be happy. You know, it's as much a choice as it is, you know, you're in a circumstance where things aren't going the way you want it to. And I think that kind of relates a little bit to mental health, depression, anxiety. It's like, at the end of the day, we can choose when we wake up, our outlook on the world, even though we may not agree with everything and uh, make a difference in somebody else's world. And so kind of end the book with here's the story, the ups and downs, the emotional roller coasters, the mortars, IED, you know, medevac, all that a little bit of, you know, things that we we, we think about, uh, you know, what could have could have happened and, and those we were with. But at the end of the day, Keith, I think that we have control of how we look at the world and what we appreciate. So um, that's, that's sort of where the book ended. And I'll just do a, a spoiler. I'm thinking about starting a project for, uh, another book on my state police career, because there's certainly a lot of material over 26 <laughs> years that might be even more exciting to the general public than a lot of folks look at this and say, oh, it's military. And they, you know, don't look twice because they weren't military. The, the people that have liked it include people that have no idea because they didn't know what they didn't know. Um, so we're, we're looking at maybe starting that project and then another one, Citizen Hero, uh, is going to be a book about everyday heroes. You know, the nurse in the emergency room, the bystander when somebody collapses, the firefighter when they get that call that's not routine. And so we're looking about for stories from other people, and then we're going to assemble those to, again, provide the reader with the everyday heroes that are around us and we may not know it. Oh, that's pretty cool. And actually, both those would be great reads. Um, and I'm sure over 26 years in law enforcement, you got some pretty crazy stories. Um I, you know, I, I decided not to get in law enforcement after my time in the Air Force because that's what I did in the Air Force. And uh, um, yeah, I realized that was not the future career path for me. It, it's a little wild and crazy. So I can I can only <laughs> I can only imagine the crazy stories and situations. So, yeah, I, I thought it'd have a lot of appeal. You know, you can't turn on television, and not have historically, you know, the, the, the crime shows justice all these, you know, those exactly. are the things that people are attracted to. And, and again, my big challenge, Keith, might be trying to, to what to leave out, right? I can only have it so big. So I need to, uh, you know, get the highlights and, uh, and focus on that. But I, I think we'll start that soon. And again, I think we'll do that with both, uh, you know, an ebook, uh, a, a soft cover and an audio book, because I want to reach as many people as possible. Oh, you definitely should do that, because the greatest show ever made was Cops. Yeah, I, I, I agree. <laughs> Especially maybe, maybe, the early well, ones, the early ones were the best. Cause when I go back and watch those and it's like, wow, they got away with that. <laughs> I mean, just the things cops could do say back in the eighties. And it's just, it's like, wow. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> interesting. And uh, what I think I'll do since you, you found it so interesting is uh, incorporate some videos that I have from, you know, my, my days uh, with the state police, uh, you know, nothing graphic, but, but things that I think the reader would be able to visualize and, and kind of grasp uh, as QR codes and uh, incorporate that uh, technology as, as I did with this book to, again, give the uh, the reader some bonus material. There you go. Awesome. Well, I look forward to uh, to, to reading those or listening to them sure. um, as, as you get those written. So, uh, well, I appreciate you for being here. I'm going to, I'm going to throw your, your link up here on Facebook. If, if you're listening, don't worry. It's down. It'll be down in the show notes as well, uh, as well as a few other links, but uh, to the book and all that other stuff. But Anywhere else that uh, people can reach reach you, Robert? Well, my email for the book is bobsnewbook at gmail.com. Bobsnewbook at gmail.com. And while that's important, it's because anybody can order it on Amazon or everywhere books are sold, right? Barnes and Noble and uh, libraries. If they don't have it, they can order it and put it on the shelf so others can read it at no cost. But if somebody wants a signed copy from me uh, that I will ship at no extra cost, I'd be glad to do that if they just send an email to bobsnewbook at gmail.com. And we'll get it in the mail to you and have it personalized. Awesome. That sounds great. 
Well, I appreciate you for being on here and sharing with, with us, you know, about your life and your story and your book, Citizen Soldier. Um, if anybody's looking for a good read, I hope, hope you check it out. Uh, so I appreciate you being here and sharing with us, Robert. Thanks, Keith. I appreciate uh, joining you today and also appreciate what you do. You've got a great guest on your podcast. I know it's it's growing and I'm in, encouraged by it. And uh, uh, I think uh, all of us uh, can think about, imagine somebody who uh, might have a story to share with you on a maybe future podcast episode. So uh, might be sending some names your way and uh, have a chat with them because uh, I've got friends that would never write a book, They can't, they're, but they would maybe have a conversation. Hey. I love conversations. That's exactly why I do this. So I, well, I, I'll take any kind of names. Uh, I love talking to people. Obviously, it's kind of kind of a prerequisite for having a podcast. Well, I think. <laughs> well, you know, you also have to be a good listener, Keith, and you're a good listener too. Sometimes my wife says I'm not a good listener all the time, but Keith, you're a good listener, and uh, I appreciate it. Enjoy listening to you. Thanks for your service. Appreciate what you're doing. Yep. But take it easy. All right. Here you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, remember, go check out my website. If there's resources that are not on there, you think should be on there, uh, please let me know. Uh, the website's battlebuddypodcast.net. And as we talked about early in this episode, if you're struggling for any reason, remember, we want you here tomorrow. That's the most important thing. So call 988-PRESS-1. You can also text 838-255. But even more importantly, like we discussed earlier, share that with your friends and family and your loved ones.